Hello class. In this lesson, we are going to continue our discussion of solubility. In the last lesson, we briefly discussed the steps to the dissolving process, and we talked about it in context with NaCl being dissolved by water. We're going to discuss how we can use those ideas to predict whether or not a substance will dissolve in a particular solvent. We will also discuss the nature of aqueous solutions, specifically strong and weak electrolytes, and we'll discuss the composition of solutions by defining concentration and molarity. So in our last lesson, we briefly discussed NaCl, which here is pictured in crystal lattice form on the left with gray sodium ions that are positive and green chlorine ions that are negative. As water surrounds the salt crystal or the crystal lattice, you will see that it is overcoming attractions for itself. So we are overcoming solvent, solvent interactions. At the same time, the positive and negative ions begin to separate from themselves, overcoming solute solute interactions. We form new interactions between solute, which is the positive or negative ion, and the solvent, which is water. As you notice here and discussed last time, the partial positive ends of the water molecules face inward towards the negative charge because opposites attract. When we look here at the positive ion, you'll see that the partial negative side of water faces inward towards the positive charge. We're going to keep those ideas in mind as we discuss how things dissolve. So when it comes to dissolving polar substances, water can form intermolecular attractions with polar substances. The negative end of the dipole of one polar molecule is attracted to the positive end of the dipole of another polar molecule, and vice versa. Here in figure 4.3, we have the ethanol molecule. You'll notice that we have a polar OH bond here with a partial positive on H and a partial negative on O. When a water molecule approaches, the partial negative end of the water molecule is attracted to the partial positive end, forming an attraction here. You'll notice that CH and CC do not have any partial charges on them because these are nonpolar bonds. They do not have a large electronegativity difference between them. Therefore, there are no permanent dipoles. Since these bonds are nonpolar, fats and hydrocarbons are not attracted to water. There are two terms we can use to describe what is happening when ethanol dissolves in water. You have the OH portion, which is hydrophilic, which means water loving, and you have the C, C, and CH portions of the molecule, which are hydrophobic, water avoiding. We have a guideline we can use to help us determine whether or not something will dissolve. And this phrase, which you probably heard in first year chemistry, is like dissolves like. It is a useful guideline for predicting solubility, but it is not an explanation or a justification. You must address the types of intermolecular forces present in both solute and solvent, and then discuss intermolecular attractions between the solute and solvent. It also helps to discuss thermodynamic favorability as a result of overcoming solute-solute attractions, solvent-solvent attractions, and then forming new solute-solvent attractions. What like dissolves like means is simply that a polar solute can be dissolved in a polar solvent as a result of forming attractions between the partial positives and partial negatives. This also works when you dissolve an ionic compound in water because those positive and negative charges of the ionic compound when separated from the lattice can form attractions with the partial negatives and partial positives of water. So if it is ionic or if it is polar, it can dissolve in a polar solvent. If it is nonpolar, it can only dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. A nonpolar solvent and a polar solute would not dissolve because they are not of the same polarity. The same idea goes with oil and water not mixing, which you've seen probably multiple times.
The nature of aqueous solutions can be broken down into several different classes. As discussed so far, we know that a solution is a homogeneous mixture where a solute is dissolved in a solvent. We use the term aqueous to describe solutions that specifically have water as their solvent. When we're looking at the phase designations after a compound and a balanced chemical equation, we typically use S, L, and G for solid, liquid, and gas, but you will also see AQ for aqueous. Electrolytes are solutions that conduct an electric current. The more mobile and charged particles that are present, the higher the concentration of ions and solution. Therefore, the better the conduction. The magnitude of the charge also matters. So if a ionic compound dissolves and it has a plus two and negative two charge, that great separation of charge conducts more electricity compared to something that has plus one, minus one as their charges. There are both strong and weak electrolytes when we talk about the extent of their conductivity. Uh, we're going to break them down into three classes for strong electrolytes. These are things that completely dissociate in solution. Strong acids, strong bases, and soluble salts are all examples of strong electrolytes. We will discuss solubility rules later for how to predict these. For example, with our strong acid, HCl, completely dissociates into H plus and Cl minus ions when dissolved in water. You can see that in picture 4.6. Strong bases are very similar. They completely uh, dissociate into their respective ions. Remember that OH is hydroxide, which is a polyatomic ion. Polyatomic ions have covalent bonds, so O and H do not split up, but they do have a negative charge when combined. And so you see that represented here in figure 4-7. Here's OH, and those two atoms are still connected together, but they have a negative charge, and they are separate from the positive sodium ions. When you look at a soluble salt, you have complete dissociation, like we saw above with NaCl. It dissociates into Na plus and Cl minus. Weak electrolytes are substances that do not completely dissociate in solution. With those, we have weak acids, weak bases, and insoluble salts. Again, we're going to look at solubility rules a little later to determine what an insoluble salt is. A weak acid example, like acetic acid, HC2H3O2, partially dissociates into H plus and acetate ions, C2H3O2 minus. Most of the particles in solution are still acetic acid. Only a small percentage are H plus and acetate ions. You can see here that these particles are your acetic acid molecules. They are stuck together with the extra H. A small percentage allows that H to dissociate into solution and break off. So there's a lot less charge in this weakly uh, acidic solution. Same idea happens for weak bases. Uh, ammonia is a classic weak base. You do need to memorize that it is a weak base, and it has a formula of NH3. When it reacts with water, water donates an H to ammonia to form NH4 plus, and OH minus in solution. However, this only happens to a small degree, and you see that there's a very little amount of charge building up in that particular solution. We also have non-electrolytes. These are solutions where dissolving has occurred, but the solute does not make ions and therefore does not conduct electricity. Typically, a polar solute dissolved in a polar solvent or a nonpolar solute dissolved in a nonpolar solvent would be an example of a non-electrolytic solution. Sugar, water, for example, where sugar dissolves in water would be an example of a non-electrolyte. The reason this is not an electrolyte is because there are no ions that form and you have a covalent compound that retains its properties. 
Same goes with the ethanol uh, solution that we discussed above. The last one that I did not put in the notes, but we'll discuss more when we get to our solubility rules, is an insoluble ionic compound. Insoluble ionic compounds are called insoluble because on the surface they appear not to dissolve. As we'll discuss later in the year, that they do actually dissolve to some small extent, but it is such a low concentration that it is not very observable, except through experiments. When we look at the composition of solutions, chemical reactions often take place when two solutions are mixed. In order to perform stoichiometric calculations, two things must be known, the nature of the reaction, which depends on the exact substance and whether it exists as ions or molecules, and the amount or the number of moles of chemical present in your solution. So we have one equation to help us with that, and it is our molarity equation. Here we use a capital M in brackets to represent concentration or molarity. Molarity and concentration are measured in units of moles per liter or MOL over L. As I said before, it can be expressed using square brackets or a capital M. The alternate form I have here incorporates grams into solution or into the equation because grams can be converted to moles and then moles can be divided by liters to form the molarity. 0.75 M means that we have 0.75 moles of our chemical contained in a 1.0 liter solution. Square brackets indicate that whatever is inside is both in solution and a concentration. If you use parentheses instead, it represents something a little bit different, so you do need to use square brackets. There's a process to preparing solutions that we need to use when we do our labs. First, to prepare a solution of known concentration, you will need a scale, the more accurate the better, and a volumetric flask, and some distilled water. You also would likely need a weigh boat to hold your solid chemical. Weigh out the solid as accurately as possible. As I said, more decimal places on the scale, the better, because this helps us with our significant figures and making sure we are as accurate as possible. Place your solid in the volumetric flask, as you can see in part A of figure 4.10. Add only enough distilled water to dissolve the solid solute and swirl to completely dissolve the solid. Do not add one liter of water all at once. Solutes have mass and volume. When they dissolve, displacement will cause the total volume to not equal one liter. So we have to add some water first, dissolve, and then top it off. Once dissolved, as you can see in picture B, you can add the remaining water up into the line uh, for part, uh, as you can see as picture C. There's only one marking for this particular flask, so you need to make sure that the flask you select matches whatever volume you need at the end of making your solution. Then you can secure the stopper. Sometimes we use parafilm to cover. And then we invert the flask a few times to ensure even distribution of the solute throughout the solution. If you have trouble getting your solid to dissolve, you can add a little more water or apply heat to improve the solubility. Let's do a calculation. Let's keep an eye on our time. Okay, exercise two, calculate molarity given grams and volume. Calculate the molarity of a solution prepared by dissolving 11.5 grams of solid NaOH in enough water to make a 1.50 liter solution. So here I am given grams and liters, but I need moles and liters in order to find the molarity. So the first thing I need to do is convert my 11.5 grams of NaOH into moles. When I add up the molar mass, 22.99 plus 16 plus 1.01, .01, I get exactly 40 grams of NaOH for every one mole of NaOH. Go through, do my calculation here. 
and I have 11.5 divided by 40. Now, I have more than four significant figures here, or more than three significant figures here, but I don't need to figure out sig figs till the end of the problem. So I have 0 0.2875 moles of NaOH. Then I can do my molarity is equal to moles over liters, which means 0.2875 moles of NaOH divided by 1.50 liters of solution. So I can go ahead, divide, takes my previous answer in the calculator, divide this by 1.5, and I get 0 0.1916666 repeating. And I need three significant figures on my answer. I see one, one, and five is three sig figs. So my answer is 0 0.192. I have to look at the six, and I see I round up. 192 molar NaOH solution. And that would be three significant figures. Remember, the leading zero does not count. So these are my three significant figures. OK. Go ahead and try the you try it set two. In our next video, we'll discuss concentrations of specific ions in solution, in addition to some other manipulations of our molarity equation. Have a good day.